Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm happy that I didn't understand everything she said about me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it has been a pleasure to be here and to hear these excellent presentations. I have learned a lot already. Just before lunch, I learned that actually I have entered the age when you become more, what was the word, bipotential. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Uh, I can assure you that I will use that potential fully in the coming years. <laughs> uh, I was also wondering when I listened to the presentations, difficult scientific problems that you can solve, you can even build a flying car, but still there's one simple thing that you, 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 seem, you, you are not able to solve just to end homelessness. So I've been wondering why is it so? Maybe it has something to do with the testosterone level of our political decision makers. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, I'm going to speak to you about homelessness, how to end it, housing first. We have 11 million empty homes in Europe. We have 4.5 million homeless people in Europe. That's one of the curious mysteries with homelessness. Why don't they meet? Is it really impossible to even dream of a world without homelessness? And I want to show you that we should dream about a world without homelessness, and that's also possible. But to change the world, you have to change the way people, people think. There has been three ways how to answer to homelessness criminalized, as they have done recently in Hungary, not very effective, costs a lot, and not very human. But just to ignore, walk, walk by, do nothing, that's also not very effective. Or then, try to solve it. And if you want to solve and end homelessness, what's the most, what, what's the most e effective way of doing it? Traditionally, it has been the staircase model. As a homeless person, you start from the bottom. First, you solve all your problems, stop drinking, whatever problems you may have, then you become, as they say, housing ready. So you start climbing step by step, first, first from homelessness to shelter, from shelter to a group home or supported housing, and finally, up there, there's not heaven, there's a a rental apartment of your own. Some ho homeless people can make it, but not all, and some, some drop back to homelessness. And the professionals call that the revolving door syndrome. This was the dominant model in the 1980s when I worked for the first time with homelessness. No one contested it. It was, it was the state of the art at that time. But already at that time, there was another way of thinking. Since the beginning of, of last year, I have been working as a director in a Y Foundation. The name Y comes from a Finnish word, yksinäinen, lonely or single. And the foundation was established in, in 1985 to get proper homes for especially single homeless people. And we have been doing it by, mostly by buying flats from the free market. We get a grant 50% from the Finnish Slot Machine Association, which is a very peculiar thing. If you gamble in Finland, you may end up in troubles, but you may help those in need because all the money goes to Slot Machine Association, which delivers the money to several hundreds of NGOs working with the people in need or at least you help those NGOs who try to help those in need. But in any case, that's the financial part. Uh, we have, at this moment, I checked it yesterday morning, we have uh, 6,675 6, flats in 52 municipalities that are, that are meant for homeless people. And normally, we let those apartments to municipalities who choose the people who are homeless in that municipality, and they make the rental contract with, with homeless people. 
and municipalities provide also the support. So they are single apartments scattered around, mostly in owner-occupied houses. So in a way, it was already the, the model that was later called housing first, scattered housing with support. But the name housing first comes from Dr. Sam Zemperis, who established this idea, this model in New York in, in the 1990s. And he has made also those principles for, the, for this, this model. I really appreciate his work. He has written a whole manual explaining the principles. I won't go into details, but to put it shortly, just treat a homeless person as a fellow human being, listen to him, offer him a decent apartment, and provide him the support he may need to get on with his life. Uh, this model has gained widespread recognition in recent years, not only in the USA, but also in several European countries, and it has proved to be a very effective method of uh, ending homelessness. Uh, I will illustrate my ideas on housing first by telling what we have been doing in, in Finland. Uh, because there are some differences between the, the US model, and in this phase it's necessary to tell a little bit about my personal history. After working for 10 years with homeless people in Helsinki, I did a lot of research and consultancy on social welfare and health issues, uh, wrote a lot of reports, evaluation reports, etc. It was quite often also very frustrating because it seemed that I've been writing re reports, tens of reports, and it seemed that the only one who came from, from my efforts was the Finnish paper industry, <coughs> sometimes. But something happened in the beginning of the century. In 2004, I was asked to conduct an external evaluation of the Finnish policies on homelessness. And you can see that we had made a great progress in, in decreasing the homelessness overall. But my main conclusion of this evaluation was that there is a very small group, a small group of long-term homeless people, and we need to find a, a better solution for long-term homeless people. So I, I recommended that we start a new national program with a clear target and very concrete goals to end long-term homelessness completely from Finland. So the government decided of this program, and these basic principles that are described here were made by the working group of four wise men, and I was acting as a, as a secretary in that group, so I had to write the report also. So, very basic things, adequate housing, permanent solutions, not temporary, like shelters, independent flats with an own rental contract, so you have a legal right for the place where you live, and adequate support and services. And I have been very lucky because when this program, which involves still several state authorities, uh, NGOs, municipalities, ten biggest cities, it's really a, a partnership program. That's why I, I say B when I describe the results. And I, was, I have been lucky because first I was evaluating things as a researcher, then I was writing the program, and then I, I was asked to act as a program leader in this program, which I did for four years. Uh, very shortly, some of the results. We have used every possible means to get homes for homeless people, long-term homeless people. The aim was to have long-term homelessness in four years. It means to get 1,250 new flats for them. So we have used social housing in municipalities, small studio apartments, we have bought apartments from the private market, and then we have built over 20 new supported housing units. They are normal housing, housing blocks, 
so everyone has a home of their own, not only a room, but a home with a key to their own apartment and a permanent rental contract if they want. One of the most important things in this program has been that we have ended the use of shelters. Shelters in Finland have a very long and dark history. After the Second World War, there was a serious lack of housing in Finland, and especially in Helsinki. So there were huge shelters. Some of them were, were in the form of bomb shelters. So you can imagine it was a very sad irony for many men, men returning from the front to, to end up living in peacetime in bomb shelters. It's a curious thing that at this moment still in the USA, one of the main goals of homelessness policy is to end the homelessness of war veterans. But those men and women are returning from quite different wars. The last big shelter was run by Salvation Army. It was closed down two years ago, and the building was completely renovated. It had formerly 250 bed places. Now it, it has 80 independent flats for former homeless people. Some in the upper floor ha have even a sea view. And there's on-site personnel. If you, are, if, if you need support, you can get it on, on the location. This is a tiny watercolor painting you can see still in one of the rooms in that building. Uh, the son of famous painter Ilya Repin, Yuri Repin, lived in that building in the beginning of the 50s for several years. Uh, and he died in 1954 when he, when he fell from the fourth floor of the building. He was a well-known figure in the city, walking barefoot also in, on, in winter time. Just to summarize the results, over 2,000 homeless people have got a home of their own. The level of housing sustainability has been approximately on this level. I know that in several projects where, you, where they have been using housing first, the level has been even higher. And what's most important, it has produced significant savings. So by housing one former homeless people, we have saved 15,000 euros minimum taxpayers' money. And this is very important when you discuss with the politicians. When somebody says to me, when some politician says to me that we can't afford to end homelessness because we have tough times now, I say to him, it's completely vice versa. Especially in these times of austerity, we cannot afford not to end homelessness. Housing doesn't solve everything. When a former homeless person gets a home of his own, keys to his own apartment, he starts wondering, where are the keys to my life? Where are the keys to my future? So the hunger for meaningfulness, for meaningful doing, work, etc., grows. There are several former homeless people who need support for a very long time. But you have to start from their strengths and their capabilities, not from their failings and their problems. Because there's a very fine aphorism by a poet, James Richardson. He said that no one has yet failed in the future. So the future is a little bit unknown also for former homeless people. There are no, no hopeless cases. For me, housing first has been an exceptional example how you can do social innovations, how you can make social changes that have real impact in, in people's lives. Uh, it has been a great experience to be working with, with this project. Uh, I'm sorry, to be honest, I must look what I have been thinking about. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how big changes you can make with so few tools. Actually, you need your head and heart. I may be a 
hopeless optimist, but I still dream of a fair world without homelessness, where everyone could have a place to call his own home, where everyone's human dig dignity would be respected. My experience is that if you want to change things, you can't convince people, not just with logical reasoning, you need to have a little bit heart in it also. So my slogan for, for our century would be a fair world without homelessness, with head and heart together. But to end homelessness, you need also to build new homes, in spite of the statistics that I showed you in the beginning. But even that's economically reasonable. By investing 1 million euros for construction, you can get homes for about 10 homeless people, and you can give work for 15 workers for one year. I have about five to six years active working life left, and I want my organization, Y Foundation, in that time to buy and build 6,000 more flats for homeless people and people in risk to become homeless. Then I could say that I have achieved something, that I have been part of something bigger. So just give me one good reason why not to end hopelessness. Thank you.